Welcome to the Gamers Inn. Come on in, pull up a chair next to the fire. It looks like you've had a long journey. I'm your host, Jocelyn, and joining me as always is my co-host, Ryan. Hello, Ryan. Hello. I was this close to making a uh, Link sound, but I thought, no, it's 2014. (laughs) We're better than that. (laughs) You're not making sound effects? Is that your New Year's resolution? I'm just not going to sound like grunty Nintendo characters this year. (laughs) Except for Animal Crossing. That's funny. I mean... (laughs) Yeah, that's... Oh, God, I hate those Animal Crossing voices. Oh, and and there he goes. There he goes. <laughs> and uh, those of you watching us live on Twitch right now will notice that we have a third chair with us tonight. We have John the Icon Master Marstall joining us again to talk all things Zelda. John, how are you tonight? Hello, I'm really good. It's good to be back with you guys. I know, yeah. So uh, we've been telling the audience for the last couple of weeks, reminding them to go back and listen to all the way to episode 15 (laughs) for the last time you were on, which was literally almost 100 episodes ago. Yeah. Wow. That's First of all, it's amazing that you guys have stuck with it for this long. Uh, That's... That's that's a big congrats right there for oh, any thanks. podcast to hit triple digits. It's been a it's been a challenge, but a really fun time. I think. I don't know. What about you, Ryan? <laughs> I mean, you know, I've always been a fan of Zelda, but to stick with it this long. Oh, we're talking about gamers. <laughs> yes, <Yeah>, gamers. Uh, <laughs> actually, both. We're very tough for for both of us. Jocelyn <laughs> fell off the wagon a little bit, but I think with this one, she's really enjoying it. Um, no, we, okay. Which one are we talking about now? Podcast or I, Zelda? <laughs> Zelda. <laughs> but no, Gamers Inn has been a lot of fun, and uh, Skype continues to be our fourth annoying Yes, <laughs> we're uh, technical difficulties again tonight, so uh, again, mm-hmm. those of you watching the video stream, our audio shouldn't be affected, but we are having issues with our Skype call, so um, their videos may come and go, but they'll, they'll still be there, we'll just keep on trucking, so uh, I guess we can probably jump right into this. Uh, we're not going to do what we're playing this week, because all we're playing is Zelda. So before we get right into it, I just want to say that Ryan and I really appreciate your continued support of our show, along with the support of our sponsor, Doghouse Systems. You can use the code THEGAMERSIN to double your RAM when you purchase a new gaming rig. Head on over to doghousesystems.com and get your order on. So this week, we are going to be talking all about The Legend of Zelda, A Link Between Worlds on the 3DS. So all three of us have been playing the crap out of this game. I actually bought my 3DS as the like official Zelda Link Between Worlds special edition version. So uh, I've really, really been enjoying it. And I, I'm going to admit that just like Skyward Sword, I haven't actually finished the game yet. <laughs> <laughs> I came so close. I am. Uh, oh God, yes, that's I am. Be tricky. So we need to avoid spoilers for Jocelyn's sake. Uh, I'm not too worried about spoilers. I was thinking about it, but really, the general plot of all Zelda games is kind of the no, same. That, this is the one game that where they throw the curveball. <gasps> really? Yeah. I think yeah. I might have actually spoiled the curveball for me. Well, I don't. I don't know. I read something online by accident when I was trying to find like a synopsis thing, and so I think I might know what the twisty okay. thing at the end is. But um, yeah. Okay. <laughs> well, we should we should at least warn warn the listeners that uh, spoilers could be yes. imminent. Yes, many, many, many spoilers. Um, so so far, I have cleared the left hand side of the map. So I've done the well. I've got I got the three things that you need to get to be able to go to the other world. And then I've cleared the swamp temple, the Uh desert one, the forest one, and one other one that I couldn't remember, but it's kind of like the first one you get to. But it's so long ago that I literally can't remember. (laughs) Is it possibly, I'm sorry, is it the thieves dungeon? That's that's one of the oh, first. Oh yes, that you, yes, it is yeah. the thieves. Yeah, that's right. That's why I couldn't remember it because you didn't really need to do anything special. You just kind of popped out into the world, and then you're running around the village, and then you know there's a door sort of thing, and you're like, oh, maybe I should go in here. Oh, it's a dungeon. It took me much longer than I would be uh, willing to admit to figure out that when it said knock on the door, it literally meant walk up to the door and push a button. <laughs> <laughs> what were you doing instances. trying to get bombs <laughs> no I, the, the doors they looked like uh trigger doors you mm. know they looked like the kind of zelda doors that you have to go find a switch somewhere for and so i'm like i'll, I'll keep looking around town for a switch to open this door and <laughs> Nothing. They, they got me they got me with that one that one was tricky you know what i tried to do like in link to the past you could use your sword to kind of 
clink against walls. Uh-huh. I thought it's like okay, and this this is a link to the past too, essentially. So I should be able to do that. So I kept going up to it, pushing B and pushing B, and it didn't work. So it was just push A. You had to talk to the guy and give him a password or something. Yeah. Yeah, you had yeah. to like um, guess the last two uh, last two lines of the song. Like he would say three verse or three lines of a verse, and you had to finish it. And then he would say three more, and you had to finish it. So I literally like I didn't even walk around the town, talk to anybody. I just walked up to the door, hit the button, guessed right, and walked in. <laughs> yeah, I did the same thing. <laughs> yeah. And then later yeah. on, I found somebody who told me the song, and I was like, oh, I was totally supposed to explore. Yeah. I didn't explore. Yeah. Which is one of the yeah, things I love that's... about this Zelda, is you can just go and figure things out. You don't have to find or do a specific thing. You can just, if you can do it, you just go. And there is no small, ever-present sprite telling you what Nintendo <laughs> thinks you're supposed to do next. <laughs> and it never tells you what button to push either. <laughs> well, it, I, was, uh, I was playing, I had beaten the game, and... Uh, I saw that John had collected all the little squid babies, so I'm like, I'm going to go try and do that, too. Okay. <laughs> so when I was doing that, um, you fu- there is that little Nintendo Navi character telling you what to do, and it's that broom chick. Every time you teleport, mm. she says, you should do this, or, or she'll strongly suggest saying, if you're stuck, you should go and talk to the fortune teller. Maybe and... I haven't been stuck yet, because I don't ever remember seeing that message. I have no idea what you're talking about with you finding the hundred of whatever. squid. What you the heck have... is a squid baby? I'm halfway through finding the sages, <laughs> and I don't even know what you're talking about. <laughs> you don't hear those little chirps all around you, like when you're running oh, around? I, um, oh, you know, I play with the sound been... off, because I am often on the uh, bus. That, that will make it a little harder. <laughs> Because they, uh, they make a little chirping sound, and basically there's a little, um, right before the water temple, there's a little path off to the side that you can uh, go to where this giant mommy squid is, and she'll say, find all my babies. <laughs> and then when you find the babies, for every ten you find and turn in, they uh, she sucks an item into her and spits it out, and it's brand new and all shiny. But I don't know how it you works. Can, yeah, but... you can get some awesome upgrades. The, oh. uh, the, the bow? will shoot three arrows in a kind of a spreader fashion. Oh, oh, uh, I thought you meant like the ice and the fire and the light arrows. And I was like, but best squid uh, ever. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's good squid. No, uh, y- yeah, you can upgrade all your all your weapons, all your tools. Some of them are just kind of, you know, they look nicer. They don't really do much. Uh, yeah. But then some of them, like the, the bow and arrow, uh, the fire rod, are actually much better weapons if you can get them upgraded. Mm, yeah, I'm not a yeah. huge fan of the bow. I haven't used it very much. I find the bow and the hook shot are really, really difficult because I just I find I can never get them pointed just the right way. So, mm-hmm. yeah, I think three projectiles would probably help me quite a lot. <laughs> mm-hmm. Yeah. But, uh, yeah, so I don't know. Like, I mean, we kind of touched on a little bit how we've all – got into the first dungeon kind of in different ways but um what order did you guys decide to play things in because i was just kind of wandering around and seeing you know like i knew that i liked the hook shot from the first games and thought that that would probably be a good way to get around and i bought the bow right off and i was just kind of walking around trying to figure out and it took me way longer <laughs> than i would like to admit to figure out how to get into that stupid swamp temple i tried everything i bought every That's... item yeah, <laughs> forgot yeah, I mean, completely about a, the hook shot. <laughs> it's kind of a swamp slash desert temple, right? And we were talking about the one in in Low Rule. Yes, yeah. In the southwest, yeah, and yeah, you kind of have to go through both areas to finish that temple, mm-hmm. uh, which is really cool. Um, that was that was the great thing about this game for me is that you could choose your own order and and choose your own adventure with these with these dungeons, you know. So you. Uh, everybody has to go through the Eastern Palace first mm-hmm. before anything else. But then you have the uh, Tower of Gales and the Tower of Hera, mm-hmm. and you can do those in either order. Then the rule opens up, and you can do those seven dungeons in any order. Mm-hmm. Um, I don't exactly remember which one I did, I did before any of the other dungeons, but I remember that I did the Ice Ruins much earlier than I think I was kind of supposed to. Because that's a really hard dungeon. That's how I felt about the desert one. That's the one that I did next was trying to get into that desert. And that boss took me forever by the time I actually got there. Yeah. Yeah, the the kind of big plant that comes up out of the ground and and you're making the the sand pathways to... Yes, to try to hit it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that was tough. (laughs) 
So what about you, Ryan? Where where did you make four first? Um, I, it's weird. Uh, I, I agree with John. I think I did the same thing. Like you know, After you beat the first two temples, you can really do those two in any order you want, and you're not really penalized. But I found that when I was doing the second part where you're, going, you're, you're saving the sages, that if you... You could do it in any order you wanted, but there was kind of like a couple that you should have done first to get like the uh, the armor and the upgrade for the sword. Um, I have my sword fully upgraded now, but I <laughs> didn't know that there was armor. So I have zero armor right now. Everything that touches Ooh. me is like just murdering me. <laughs> <laughs> so it was probably a good idea for me, which I did not do, but to write down where those items were. If, I, if you want to do hero mode and you don't want to like quickly die because the difference is when you go into the dark world those guys that throw the bombs would oh. take like three hearts off of you <laughs> that's and then what they're with... doing right now <laughs> yeah exactly so then with the with the armor and by armor it's just well i won't spoil it it's armor and <laughs> and it gives you uh it cuts it in half really and it's it's essential because you know you only have 20 hearts but by the time you get to that boss and the fairies only restore like what four or five hearts five yeah mm -hmm. Yeah, they take you down pretty quick, and I, I was really surprised that uh, there was a lot of parts in that game that I actually didn't do before I beat the game. Like, I never got the Pegasus boots, you know? <laughs> Those are all side mm -hmm. stuff. Mm -hmm. It's it's weird. It's uh, But no, in, in terms of an order, I don't think... I just, like, if I couldn't get to it, i just turn around and go do something else. Mm -hmm. oh, I totally great. should have done that because I got hung up. I beat the dungeon with the thieves, and then I mm -hmm. kept trying to get to the desert. And I know Ryan and I talked about this a few weeks ago where I was just completely and utterly stuck, and I could not figure out how I got over there. And I know, that I, like, I knew that I had done it once, but then there was a little while there where probably about a week, week and a half where I didn't pick it up. And then I just completely forgot the path that I took to get into the desert. But I could see on the map all of the little, like, vertical colored lines showing me the, the portal, mm -hmm. the portals between worlds I'd found. So I'm like, I know I've been there. I can see the lines. I know I've been there. <laughs> I was driving myself mad trying to figure out how to get back. Eventually mm -hmm. I did, but oh, it was so frustrating. <laughs> Yeah, turning yeah. around was really nice, and just going elsewhere felt like you, you felt like you're you're like yeah, screw you, Sage. Then you're gonna be stuck there for a little bit longer <laughs> in your fancy painting <laughs> frame. I'm going elsewhere. <laughs> you, you guys remember the original Legend of Zelda? I mean, uh, for me, for me, I played it so long ago that it's a little vague now. But um, I do remember that you could pretty much walk anywhere on that overworld map. And you could walk into areas of that overworld that you were very much not supposed to be in. Mm. <laughs> you know, you could go way up north to Death Mountain and uh, face those uh, Lynels with their with their sword beams <laughs> long before you had the weapons to deal with them. Mm. And you can do that in Link Between Worlds. You mm -hmm. definitely can get decimated. <laughs> yeah. And for me, that is exactly what Nintendo ought to be providing with Legend of Zelda mm -hmm. is a world that I can wander out into, explore, uh, encounter dangers that I'm not ready for yet, and then decide, you know, I'm going to go ahead and brave it and, and you know, get my behind handed to me or <laughs> come back later when I'm a little bit more prepared. And, mm -hmm. and it's, it's so great to me that they trust the player enough in that game to leave that up to you mm -hmm. rather than trying to handhold you and gate you via some item that you don't have yet in order to prevent you from getting into those situations. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, the nice part about this game is that they still, they give you best of both worlds. They allow you to explore. They allow you to go around. They set that up, set the world up for you, but they also nudge you in the right direction by putting that little X on the map, which was sort of like, you know, here's all here's where all of the people are that you need to save get around to it at some point mm -hmm. they are in horrible danger and probably being tortured but so you might want to hurry up <laughs> yeah but uh, someone's stabbing the painting with scissors <laughs> no, just painting little mustaches on all of them <laughs> colors like ah, you know giving them an old wario stash yeah. but uh, there you go yeah it's just it was it was perfect for me because i i like to explore but i also like to know where i need to go mm -hmm. uh, i like, like the direction yeah, just Absolutely. a little X on the map. And, I mean, I didn't go back and listen to our episode uh, from two years ago. 
But judging by the notes, I reviewed them. We addressed, we talked about this in the opposite. Like, this is almost mm-hmm. the high rule to the low rule that was lashed two years ago. See what I did there, guys? <laughs> yeah. Very you know? witty, very so, witty. <laughs> well, I tried. That's why I'm here. Um, but no, I, I, uh, I just really enjoyed the the way what they done and i hope that based on we do we know how well this game did i know it did very well critically but it, it, did it do well in sales like, i don't know i don't know sales numbers mm. just let me google Pokemon. that for you <laughs> okay well you do that jocelyn's gonna <laughs> google it but if it does do well and uh the main dude uh man i'm usually pretty good with that what's his name the guy who's been writing on napkins not awada the chief uh well IG, you talking about um, Anuma? Yeah, Anuma. He, he has uh-huh. stated that uh, this 3DS game is going to, is sort of the beginning of all the changes they've been experimenting on. Mm-hmm. And if this you is, know, a, I would, yeah, I would like to believe that, but I don't believe it. You don't believe it? I think I think they're on the console side. I think they're mm-hmm. so tied to the Ocarina of Time model, mm-hmm. uh, and they cannot get out of that groove. The 3DS allows them to experiment and deviate because the expectations are not there in the same way that they are for console Zelda. Hmm. I think mm-hmm. Nintendo is terrified of, of moving away from that over-the-shoulder 3D lock-on with some helpful sprite that tags along for the entire game kind of approach that they've been following since the first, you know, the N64 mm-hmm. Zelda games. And yeah. uh, I, I think their conservatism is just is just going to keep killing them on that series on the console side. Mm-hmm. Yeah, as I wish um, I could say you're wrong, but you're probably right. <laughs> as, <laughs> I hope you're wrong. as of December 12th, so that mm-hmm. would have been three weeks after the game released, I think, maybe not even quite that much, um, 400,000 copies in the U.S. That's pretty good. That's pretty good. For Nintendo a, game. Yeah, for a Nintendo game and a mobile title and... All the rest of it, three weeks in, that's pretty fantastic. So, no, I mean, uh, I'm, I'm hoping that they that they break out, and we won't we won't know for sure until E3, and you know, it might just be the same thing. It'll be well, okay. They do the same thing with Nintendo, or the same thing with Mario, the same thing with Donkey Kong. Who's to say that they're going to break the mold with Zelda? Probably one of their most treasured franchises. If anything, they're going to try something different with, I don't know, they keep beating Star Fox up, why don't they try something different with him? <laughs> like, you know, it's, it sucks, but uh, I don't know, I just, I really hope that they do kind of do something different, but... With all the success, they might. They might take a look at this versus the numbers of, say, like Twilight Princess and Skyward Sword and just go, wow, like, <laughs> those ones didn't do this well, didn't sell that fast, you know, we have a really large strong fan base who want to buy our game who go Mm -hmm. out and buy consoles like i don't know what the numbers of um the specific zelda console that i bought are but i mean like if they've got these kind of numbers coming out of the 3ds versus their console titles i mean maybe it will be enough to be like well if the dollars are voting this way then maybe we'll change it i can always hope (laughs) well nintendo has publicly stated after the numbers that got unleashed last week that they are they just seem surprised (laughs) finally they've clued in they're surprised that they're not doing so well they're like oh what's going on and they're kind of saying we're gonna have to reevaluate the business model Mm -hmm. now i get excited but people who are not happy with nintendo already are like yeah yeah fool me once shame on me fool me twice (laughs) all that normal thing but I kind of I kind of think that that uh, releasing the same old Nintendo title like a new Zelda that is just literally Zelda, you know, a different it's not different at all. Mm-hmm. Nintendo's already proven that that's not going to work. Yeah. Because look at Mario, it's another 3D platforming Mario game that's excellent, but it's not different enough that has caused the console to start selling. Mm-hmm. It's a great game and it's a great Nintendo game, but it's not different. To make people want to put down their PS4s, Xbox Ones, and mm-hmm. hell, Xbox 360s to yeah. go pick up this new console. Yeah. So they have to try something different. They can't make another Ocarina of Time. <laughs> well, they can, but yeah. it's just not going to save <laughs> They'll them. just remake it again. Well, they will. <laughs> yeah. They will. The, yeah. However yeah. many 10th yeah. anniversary or HD. whatever. Yeah. <laughs> uh, oh, they'll remake yeah. 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 that game. But they, I, I'm telling you, I don't want them to make Legend of Zelda, insert new subtitle here, that is essentially that just, is just a clone. Yeah. 
I don't I don't think Nintendo's games are the problem with the Wii U. Well, the games yeah. that they're making are fine. Yeah. Uh, you know, uh, Mario 3D World is fine. Uh, Pikmin 3 is fine. Uh, the problem is they're the only ones making games for the Wii U. Yeah. And mm -hmm. that's not enough. It's not enough for a $300 system that's going to take up space and probably replace something in your entertainment center. Mm -hmm. You know, when you pick up an Xbox One or a PS4, your expectation is most of the games coming out, no matter the publisher, Activision or or uh, Konami or, or Capcom or, or whoever it is, I'm probably going to be able to get that game on this system. With the Wii U, the expectation is that you will not get that game for mm -hmm. that system. The only games you'll have access to are almost exclusively Nintendo published games, mm -hmm. which are great. You know, most of them are very good, but Nintendo cannot carry that load themselves anymore. Mm -hmm. And and they're not on the 3DS. The 3DS is a great third-party library. I was just playing the Bravely Default demo from Square Enix uh, last night. Um, you know cool turn-based RPG, uh, the kind of game that, you know, you're probably not going to see on the Wii U because Square Enix is not going to get the return that it needs mm -hmm. to, to design a game for that. Uh, but on the right. 3DS, it's there. On the 3DS, you know, all the major publishers are, are putting out cool games, well-regarded, well-reviewed games for it. Mm -hmm. Now, is that just the requirement of hardware parity with, with the systems? Like, you think if they made a Wii U 2 and made it the same graphical intensity that the PS4 and Xbox One has, that essentially is just, I mean, I don't, I'm, I am a programmer, but I know there's no button that says, okay, now that it's the similar hardware, we can just hit the compile on Wii U button here. <laughs> that's not, that's not true, but it is essentially a lot easier to build a game for similar hardware. You know, if it, the Wii U, they, you know, they have to have a, a separate team developed for the Wii U. So I, you're right, like, unless the company is uh, is going to say, set out, like Ubisoft has been doing, set out to make an exclusive Wii U game, probably not going to see it. I mean, we'll see, well, we're not going to see any more because now that the PS4 and Xbox One is out, it's like, that's their focus and they'll, there's no point, there's no money in making a Wii U title. Um, uh, yeah. I don't think Nintendo needs hardware parity with the competition. I mm -hmm. think they need to make life easy for developers. Mm -hmm. Whatever that means, you know, if yeah. that means making, you know, switching to AMD chips so that uh, the the programming tools carry over better, it, it might just mean, you know, providing better support to the developers. I know some developers have complained that Nintendo doesn't have a lot of English speakers uh, that are able to provide development support for them. Um, Nintendo has always, always regarded third parties as uh, as a nice to have. You know, mm -hmm. as icing on the cake. If if they want to make games for a system, we're not going to stop them, <laughs> and that's fine. But they've never had the attitude of we need these guys to survive, and we need to go out and and develop these relationships, make sure they're getting what they need to produce great content for our system. That's the attitude right. that they need to have now. Mm -hmm. So, do you think Nintendo? takes another napkin off the pile and writes third parties on it and takes it back to Tokyo and says, this is what we're going to do, guys. Or well, do they know, they've do something different? <laughs> they, they have talked that talk more than once. I mean, that yeah. that's a, it's a litany that we've heard uh, at least since the GameCube era and possibly earlier, and, and they just continue to not deliver on that promise. Uh, I don't know what they're doing wrong. Um, I, I can only see that there is something going wrong in the relationship with third parties. And, you know, we can all read the complaints from insiders at these development studios about uh, Nintendo's relationship with them. And I don't have that solution, but I think they need to solve it. Mm. Maybe they should put out a new Zelda game for it. <laughs> I was going to say, so back to Zelda. <laughs> <laughs> I take I take blame for that one. Yeah, that was totally your rabbit hole there. <laughs> So, I mean, we were talking a little bit about um, the consoles and the, you know, transfer over of the success of the Link Between Worlds over to potentially the Wii U. Um, I wanted to talk to you guys a little bit about mechanics because the one thing about the 3DS is you have that 3D feature there. So for me, I mean, that's almost akin to motion control in that I was like, whoa, whoa, you're going to do what to the what in my Zelda now? Like, no. <laughs> Just let, let me just 
push four buttons and I'll get to the buttons later, but just let me push four buttons and, you know, move around and I don't need anything more than that. Um, so what did you guys think about the, the implementation of the 3D in Link Between Worlds? I did not use it. I, I was on a 2DS for almost right. the entire game. Uh, oh. I <laughs> you just yeah. blew Ryan's mind. <laughs> we didn't think <laughs> anyone was going to buy DS. those. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Wait, you have oh, kids cool. though, right? Yeah. 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 Oh, okay. We do. I, it's it's a great way to get into that library. You know, it's affordable. Uh, they're they're nice to use. They're comfortable to hold and uh, much less you likely have to break. To all the same games. <laughs> um, so, you know, I, that did not cause any problems for me. Obviously, some of the puzzles were designed with uh, levels of depth to them. Mm. And uh, there there were times where I said to myself, I wonder if this would make a little more sense on a 3DS than a 2DS. But when I actually got to try the game on a 3DS XL uh, that uh, my nephew had, uh, I was trying to solve a puzzle that had been giving me trouble on the 2DS, and the 3D did not help me at all. Mm. Uh, I had trouble even, even maintaining the, the 3D sweet spot. So I... No, I, I okay, right that's actually, yeah, that's a, a good point, because I know both Ryan and I have talked about difficulties that we have, and I wear glasses, and I don't, Ryan, do you wear your glasses when you play on the 3DS? The 3D only works when I have my contacts in. These, yeah. The glasses do something weird to it. Yeah, that's my big problem, is that I almost have double vision. The second one is quite faint, and I can see the 3D all right, but it's almost like a drop shadow or something, like it looks yeah, so exactly. weird. So uh, I play with it um, almost completely off, although I've run into some of those puzzles too where you think, okay, wait, or I, I'll try to like jump onto something I think is below me and I run into a wall instead because it's an up pillar, not a down pillar. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so I've definitely experienced the, the kind of, oh, that would have been more clear in 3D moments. But um, overall, I mean, motion control on the Wii and the Wii, well, I guess I haven't actually tried it on the Wii U, but... I assume it still sucks it's the same thing <laughs> yeah but uh yeah trying it on the wii i mean it just almost it broke the gameplay for me like i just hated it so much and you're just sitting there whoosh 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 it's like damn it no i just want to push a button and i never felt that way with the 3d like i mean there was some parts where i felt i turned it on and it helped a little and but for the most part i could just leave it off and it was like it wasn't even there and if they could do that with their consoles where it was just optional and I could say I don't want anything to do with motion control, I would be such a happy camper. <laughs> yeah. yeah. The 3D, I played uh, it in 3D a lot. I even played it today just kind of like playing around with it and trying the different mechanics just to re-familiarize uh, myself with it. And the 3D looks great. I never really ran into any issues where I needed it to solve a puzzle, but it just really made everything look cool. Mm -hmm. You know, there was a moment, I think there's a moment uh, on Death Mountain where you kind of have to continuously jump off platforms. Mm -hmm. And in 2D, sometimes you'd lose your footing and you, you know, misstep and you wouldn't really know where you're going to land. But in 3D, it was always very clear where you were going, mm -hmm. where you were landing. And again, to me, it was all about aesthetics. It just looked really cool. It added to the um, to the already excellent art style, and it didn't impact performance whatsoever. Mm -hmm. But again, totally optional, and uh, I don't think Nintendo's really made a game on the 3DS that requires 3D, or at least a major game that required 3D, as opposed to on the Wii and Wii U, where they were making games, specifically Skyward Sword to keep it on topic, that required motion control. Mm -hmm. Like, it was not optional, and I think that's where you sort of cut your market in half. Like, there are still people out there who do not like motion control. There are people out there that do not like 3D because mm -hmm. they literally can't use or see it. Mm -hmm. So I think it's important that Nintendo made it optional. I'm certain they could have done stuff where it's like, if you don't use 3D, you're boned, mm -hmm. you know? But uh, no, it just looked great, and that was really the only thing it added to it. Yeah. No, I felt the same. So uh, I had it. Oh, um, the one part in the forest temple, right mm. when you go in the front door. And again, I had my 3D off and this still scared me so badly. The When the very first time that the like disembodied hand pops up oh. over your face, like from the bottom <laughs> yeah. of the screen, I was just like, <gasps> oh, right. <laughs> and that the, kind the of... The wall master. Yeah, that was um, yeah. the first... I remember that 
the disembodied hand being really frightening in Ocarina of Time as well. And I feel mm. like it was such a better implementation of the idea in this one because, I mean, I went out of my way so many times to kill it because in Ocarina of Time, when you killed it, it didn't come back. Whereas this one, it's like it bought you maybe 30 seconds and then it was back yeah. again. That whole entire yeah. temple, I felt like I was in constant peril and I had to do things really quickly to get out of the way or duck underneath yeah. something. And I felt that at least the four temples that I've played so far in Low Rule are really challenging and I feel like I could die at any moment and I would rather feel like that in a video game than feel like I'm getting my hand held. What do you guys think on the difficulty level? Was it too too hard, too easy, good balance? What do you think? Any frustrating points? It was the perfect balance for me. Uh, I uh, and, and you know I went out of my way to make it more challenging for myself. Uh, there are lots of optional challenges in Link Between Worlds. There's treasure dungeons that are completely separate from the uh, Seven Sages dungeons that you do not have to tackle at all. They just get you lots of rupees. <laughs> uh, and they're some of the most interesting, uh, challenging puzzles in the game. They really use that uh, 2D wall uh, crawling mechanic um, ingeniously and, and make you really think about the layout of the rooms. Uh, I, I completed all of those. I Which is so the, funny uh, because I just found one this afternoon on the way home on the bus and I was like, I started going in, started getting some money and then I'm going on and on and on. And I'm like, what? what is this? Why is this even here? And then I got to a puzzle that was even just remotely challenging and I'm like, why am I even here? Okay, I'm out. <laughs> I was like, For the Screw challenge. This. <laughs> I was like, I have sages to find before Friday night. <laughs> but, but seeing a lot of Zelda games in the past, rupees were kind of... Uh, extraneous mm -hmm. you know, right because once you once you buy a few things once you get your shield and you know fill up a few bottles of potion there's not a lot to spend your money on but in this game you need to buy those items and some of those items cost 1200 rupees i know they're so expensive to buy for <laughs> real uh which is great yeah <laughs> it gives you motivation to hunt for rupees in the regular dungeons to, to go through those treasure dungeons to fill up on rupees as much as you can because you will eventually use them. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I, have you guys ever hit a point where you wanted to buy something to get to the next temple and you weren't able to because you didn't have enough? No, I mean, I always had enough to rent. Mm. Uh, oh, yeah, no, no. I <laughs> eventually I got a mortgage down on that fire rod and I eventually was able to get it out of that place but, did uh, Tom Nook come to collect <laughs> no Tom Nook is a baby compared to this Ravio guy I mean that hood you don't know what's under there that's true yeah, but, Tom Nook uh, will, not, will not leave your corpse on yeah. the engine floor Tom Nook will as send he, his he, little uh, baby raccoons after your items when you die <laughs> at least he he'll help you up your items. oh man <laughs> So, uh, <laughs> Tom will let you keep the house. <laughs> yeah, he just he'll just wait forever for you to pay those bells. He'll That's even true. take them from your dying corpse when you eventually do perish. <laughs> those of you who are totally lost right now, this is an Animal Crossing reference. This is not a Zelda reference. Um, but yeah, I found that uh, I've hit my first, uh, I guess, rupee wall, and uh, I finished my fourth dungeon, and I went to go get the bombs, and I didn't have enough. And I was like, because oh, I've been buying everything outright because I didn't yeah. ever want to lose anything. So yeah. um, I've bought everything outright and it's a good thing because I died like probably 10 or 15 times trying to beat that uh, desert sand boss. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, it's a good thing that I bought all my items because otherwise I would have just blown through all my money. But now I found that I went to go, I had to buy the bombs because you can't really go anywhere on the right-hand side of the map without them. Everything is behind the um, kind of cracked wall sort of thing that you know you can blow up except you can't blow up the really big rocks what's that about <laughs> yeah well have you have you seen where the big bomb is i found the big bomb once and yeah. i haven't been able to find it again <laughs> i have a general right. idea well, it's just it's south of town it's oh, okay south of town. yeah uh, but I... you have to be very careful with leading it around the map because it, it's very fragile no. <laughs> it's not fragile it's just it's got a uh, it's volatile we'll say <laughs> yeah it's volatile that's right um so, so hypo uh, what is it 
Hydro- hydroglycerin minigame in uh, Legend of Nitro, Zelda. nitroglycerin. Nitro. What did I say? Hydro. <laughs> That's not yeah. a thing. <laughs> not yet. It, it isn't yet. <laughs> Maybe it's a Nintendo. <laughs> I don't know that yet. Yeah, really. <laughs> uh, so uh, I have, we mentioned it a couple minutes ago when we were talking about some of the puzzles, but uh, I wanted to touch on the 2D wall crawling mechanic. So in Link Between Worlds, you have the ability very early on to basically stick to a wall as a painting and uh, that's kind of the theme that runs through the entire game is the uh, the super evil guy from low rule is transforming everyone into paintings so he does that to link and then you get the ability to uh, essentially break away from that spell or invoke the spell whenever you need to so you can solve puzzles by crawling along walls as a painting so um, what did you What did you think about that, John? Was that something that you, you did you enjoy the mechanic? I found it was um, often implemented almost too much, but uh, it took me a while to get used to. How did you feel about mm. that one? I thought it was fantastic. I never got tired of that because I, I think a lot of it, you know, is from coming from Link to the Past, uh, and then being presented with this this world um, in the same perspective, the same top down perspective. Um, my mind like locked onto that and said, okay, this is the way the world is structured. It's a link to the past world. And the fact is that world is created in polygonal 3D. And as soon as you merge into a wall, uh, the perspective changes and you can navigate side to side uh, all around the room until you hit a block. Mm -hmm. And I never quite got used to that. So even towards the end of the game, uh, the the game would you know throw a, another wall merging puzzle at me, um, and I would I would be sitting there looking at this room saying <laughs> there's nowhere for me to go. <laughs> I did that so many you know, times. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, for me that was that was fantastic because it was constantly challenging me to uh, get get past my my own preconceptions about the world of of Zelda the top-down world of Link to the Past and mm -hmm. this top-down world of Link Between Worlds. And, and you know, it sounds like marketing, but think about it in a <laughs> new way. Um, and uh, I really enjoyed that. Mm -hmm. It was, it was a, a brain teaser that kept teasing my brain throughout the whole game. <laughs> what about you, Ryan? What did you think of the 2D wall crawling? Uh, I thought it was a really neat mechanic. I mean, usually Nintendo likes to throw... The okay, and this one link can stick the wall. <laughs> <laughs> you know? I was just, I looked at it at first and I was super excited about a new Zelda, and then I was like, oh man, it's Paper Mario. <laughs> well, it's not that, but, well, Paper Mario, it's not like <laughs> exactly like that, but it's it's close, but it's weird. Like, I'm trying to think of other ones, like Nintendo, another one they did that worked really well was Majora's Mask. Oh, you I know? loved that you one. Have three days, and then you rewind, it's like Back to the Future, but with less old people that yell at you. <laughs> But, you know, it's, and that one worked, but then I'm, I'm trying to think of another one that, that didn't, but, uh, you know, each one has its own little gimmick or a little thing that you can do differently from all the other ones, and this one was sticking to, to the wall, and I'm right there with John and you in the sense that there would be puzzles, like, especially the treasure puzzles, which are strictly <laughs> stick-to-the-wall puzzles, and I'd be sitting there like, how am I going to do this? Like, I keep falling. <laughs> oh, wait. <laughs> And then they introduce the sand rod, mm -hmm. and then that adds a whole other layer because you're creating your own wall. Yes, yeah. And it's just, ah, yeah. oh, it's crazy. It's so good, though. <laughs> and and I hope they don't do it again because it won't be as special the second time, yeah. I guess. It uh, completely blew my mind the first time I did that. I was, like, literally standing there with the sand one going, I can't get on these things. They're too high. I don't understand. What am I supposed to do? Like, making pillar after pillar after pillar after pillar, wasting all my purple energy. And then, finally, I was just like, oh, wait, merge, right, stick to the wall, right. <laughs> like, that game has a way of making you feel very dumb and very smart at the same time. Yep, absolutely. Mm -hmm. yes. Even even that late in the game, you know, you're still slapping your head and, and saying to yourself, "Oh, that's right, I can merge to walls." <laughs> <laughs> but then once you figure it out and you get to that treasure chest, or you get to the next door, you feel pretty good. Absolutely. Yeah. So one thing that I did notice about the 2D wall crawling, because basically what happens is you go into the wall and you become invincible to whatever's happening around you. So in boss fights, in particular, um, the one in the swamp temple with the kind of octopus thing with all the eyes that you had to hook shot 
And then, um, not the desert one, but the um, forest temple where you had, again, the the disembodied hand, but he had a, like, a gauntlet oh, on. The knuckle master. The, yeah. Uh, how do you know all the names of these things? <laughs> He's got the prima uh, official don't... strategy guy. Yeah. <laughs> It's in the Hyrule Historia. Just oh, I haven't read all the way through. Uh, <laughs> no, I don't know how I know that one. Uh, but uh, that was a cool boss. It, it was been, a cool boss, yeah. You've been dealing with these wall masters for that whole dungeon. <laughs> and uh, solving puzzles with the wall masters, you know, baiting them to, mm -hmm. to hit switches and things. Yeah. And, stuff. Mm -hmm. and then you get to the end of that, and it's the biggest wall master you've ever seen. <laughs> I thought that was really fun. Yeah, it no. like, oh, not these guys again. <laughs> Except if you Daddy kill him, we should all be gone away. Yeah. Yeah. I felt a little bit like, almost like I was cheating, in, in particular in those two boss fights, because it was like, they had these moves where if I got in the way, I would lose like half my hearts. Like they were these crazy hard hitting bosses. And yet if I just merged into the wall, all of a sudden none of their attacks could touch me. So yeah. once so I learned the timing, then... I was just like, oh, well, I just, you know, count to five and merge to the wall and then come out and hit him and count to five yeah. and merge to the wall. And, you know, I felt almost like there was too much of a rhythm to that. And they used the 2D wall crawling too much as an escape. And I don't know. Did you guys feel the same way? Because I felt like um, it was the only way to beat those two specific bosses. Yeah, I mean, the, the... sorry, go ahead, John. They they know. I mean, they know that you have that ability. If you, uh, I'm, I'm thinking of the the dark temple in particular. Uh, one second, John. You're going kind of buzzy. Um, 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 Your mic might have just come out a little bit. Yeah. Okay. okay. Let's see. Uh, getting about any better? Nope. <laughs> oh no. Oh. No. oh. Skype. <laughs> oh, God, Skype. Microsoft. Wait. Oh. Uh, yeah, I'm going to fix that. Do you want to hang up and come right back? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> I hate Skype so much. Oh. Now it's worse. <laughs> All I hear is bubbling. Yeah. Wait. so weird. I know. Oh, we were doing such a good show, too. I know. Oh, Skype has just been the worst. It really has been. Like, this is... This is the worst Skype experience we've had so far on The Gamers yeah. Inn. Man, like I say it every time, and every single podcaster says it, but if someone would just build an app that did podcasting. <laughs> yeah. Uh, app, come on. Technical difficulties, guys. We'll be right back. And we were talking... Okay, don't forget, Ryan. We were talking about 2D mechanic in boss fights. Right. I will even... I'll write it down. Two. Oh. Okay. Oh! It, yes, it's better. Okay, good. Yeah, so you just cut that part out of the... <laughs> yeah, I guess. <laughs> It'll be fine. It'll be fine. Uh, yeah. So the Dark Palace, uh, <laughs> they they require you to do that um, because you cannot see the boss. Uh, oh. He, he's uh, you go into the room and it's totally pitch black in there. You have to light the lanterns in order to see him, uh, and then the lanterns go out. And the lanterns are on opposite corners of that room. So what you have to do is light the lantern merge with the wall, scoot around to the opposite corner, light the other lantern, and then get out of there and, and hit him with your sword. Mm. So th they totally expect you to use that wall merging as part of those boss, boss fights, as long as there's a wall in the room. Some boss fights have no walls. Like mm -hmm. the sand boss. <laughs> mm -hmm. 
Um, yeah, I don't. I haven't actually made it to that boss fight yet. Um, I still have, I guess, the ice one, which I can't figure out how to get to. I'm really struggling with finding my way. Um, I went all the way up to Zoro's do Zoro's domain again, and I, yeah, I was just like, oh, it's totally gonna be this. Oh, it's not this way. <laughs> you got me, Zelda. I was like, ice. That's where the water is. But uh, so I still have that one to do. That was where I was heading this afternoon, and then I still have the other two. So. Um, I guess the dark one is kind of in the middle on the right hand side of the map and then whatever's in the bottom right corner I haven't done yet either so I think that's probably fire based because <laughs> I haven't hit a fire dungeon yeah. yet <laughs> that's yeah the turtle rock dungeon that's, mm. that's what that is I oh, find that's a fun one. yeah I found that they specifically with the swamp dungeon it was just the water temple all over again did you guys <laughs> notice any other uh, themes in the temples where you know you recognize them from other Zelda games, other iterations. Hmm. I'm trying to think. Like the the ones that were supposed to feel like past dungeons, like uh, the first dungeon you go through through, it felt very similar to uh, the first dungeon. Or maybe it was the second dungeon in a link to the past. Hmm. But other than that, like obviously the wind dungeon, the kind of remind. I had just played through Wind Waker, so <laughs> it it felt very similar to. Uh, like a similar style in, in, in puzzles and stuff where you're going through the vents and stuff similar mm -hmm. to that. But nothing really, like, called back. It's been so long since I've played some of these Zelda games, so... I think it's probably mm -hmm. because I've literally played through Ocarina probably seven or eight times start to finish. So, I mean, that one is it. just so fresh in my head all the time that I was just like, I walked into the swamp temple and I was just like, oh, water temple. Oh, water levels. Yep, here we go. <laughs> but I did find this one was challenging, but not, not frustrating. Although the water temple is one of my favorites in Ocarina of Time because it is so challenging. It can get really frustrating at times. And this one was very clear about um, where the water level was and what you had to do to change it. And it was all really easy, all in the same room, as opposed to, you know, being all over the freaking place. <laughs> I, I think I got stuck in that one pretty briefly until you until you start to realize that um, the water level, you're sort of stuck with that water level to a certain extent. Like, mm -hmm. you could, I think you can lower it and get out of specific rooms to have it affect other rooms. Mm -hmm. But it was all very, you know, it was confined in a way that didn't make it as complex as the water temple mm -hmm. in o Ocarina, it but still me, interesting. It took me a really long time to realize that there were two separate water levels, a water level for the first floor and a water level for the <laughs> basement, and they weren't tied together because I was like, right. ooh, this is really easy. I can just, you know, change the water level to all the way down or all the way up or whatever it was I needed it at the time. And then I went all the way down to the basement and then was like, oh, <laughs> my water level is the opposite of what I need it to be right now. So... Uh, once I figured that out, which was very close to the end of the temple, um, it, it was quite easy. Well, <laughs> easy. <laughs> Air quotes. Well, yeah. um, the game was never easy. No, you know? no. Which was great. It was never, it was never, like, Skyward Sword is pretty, is fresh enough in my mind that I know that I can say that that game was easy. It pointed you in a direction, you went there, you did this for an hour, and then you were done. Mm -hmm. But in this one, it was sort of like, you know, there were challenges. I died, you know, as sucky as it is to say that I did, but <laughs> I died and I watched my items fly away and it was <laughs> that sad. stupid little bird thing. <laughs> you know, and, and you, and John's right, you can make it as challenging as you want. Like, you could probably look up a guide for how to make A Link Between Worlds the hardest Zelda game you've ever played. And mm -hmm. it's like, do it in this order and you will hate yourself, but you will be so happy that you did it. Yeah. You know, I... I don't imagine my, I'll ever do that, but I'm <laughs> thinking I might do hero mode. Mm. I've always liked the idea of playing through a Zelda game again right away, but I've never done it. Okay, so, so what is hero mode? Because I haven't actually finished the game yet, so I don't know what hero mode is. So explain. Well, hero mode's in every Zelda game, I believe. And it's usually like, it's sometimes called second quest, but I think in, in this one, it's literally just you take more damage and that's it. Yeah, do, you enemies are tougher. do you start yeah. off with your same amount of hearts and progress through the game the same, or do you start off with like your full oh. complement of hearts and just have at it? I don't know. I think I, I would think you start over. 
but I could be wrong. Start over, it's just in like super hard mode? <laughs> yeah, really, you're just starting over in, in hero difficulty mode. And, mm. um, you know, it'd be, I think we even talked about this two years ago. It's like, it's coming back to me. But it'd be great <laughs> if you could start in hero mode, mm. you know, like choose a difficulty level because yeah. they've already got the programming there. Yeah. But uh, yeah, I think it is literally just hard mode. So, yeah. So do you guys think you're going to play through that? Ryan, you said maybe. John, what about you? I uh, kind of into Luigi's Mansion now. Mm. Uh, oh, yeah, you've moved on already. <laughs> <laughs> Poor Zelda. Well, I, I milked Zelda pretty hard, though. Uh, I did the treasure dungeons. <laughs> mm, I found right. all the Mai Mai. Uh, I got the Master Ore, uh, all four pieces. Oh, there's um, four pieces. I got two. Oh, yeah. man. I got two, yeah. went to the blacksmith. He made my sword pink, which I was like, all right. Uh -huh. And then uh, he oh, was like, oh. I went back to him again, and he was like, nope, I can't do any more. I've done as much as I can. I'm the best well, he, in the well, world. He tells you, I believe, is he tells you, I'm the greatest blacksmith in the world. Yes, he does. Yeah. So but you know <laughs> there's, there's two. another world. <laughs> Wait a minute. I haven't, I've only got a red sword. Is that That's not the max. That's not the max sword. Ah, uh, I really need to go. I, screw hero mode. I need to beat the game. Just, uh, you know, that's that's where the compasses really come in handy on those dungeons. Make sure that you've opened every treasure chest in every dungeon. Oh, uh, sometimes I, I think I've skipped one or two um, in a dungeon. And I'm trying to think, because I remember I went to a few of the kind of extra treasure chests. And they were always just rupees. And I was like, well, you know, I've got enough money, so... You know, I don't have to open everything. Apparently, I have to open everything. Because I think there was one specifically in either the Swamp or the Forest Temple that was uh, one room I never got to. And it just had a treasure chest in it. And I was like, well, I have all the keys to finish the dungeon. So I should probably just move on. You know, whatever. <laughs> that looks like it's hard. I just yeah. want to beat the boss. <laughs> yeah. The, uh, the, the Master Ore, I won't spoil it for you, but there is a piece of Master Ore in the Dark Palace. And that is the hardest one to find in my oh, opinion interesting mm. but it, it is possible it's just the the trick is just particularly ingenious mm. oh, now i want to go there <laughs> screw you ice temple <laughs> 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 um so i think um that pretty much does it i guess before we move on uh just quickly favorite and least favorite boss ryan go <laughs> uh it's really hard. Like, I think I went through the game too quickly because yeah. it's really hard for me to remember. And I beat it a while ago, but I beat it over the Christmas break. Mm. I'm trying to remember bosses specifically. I mean, the one that comes to mind, uh, just based on our conversations, was the um, the, the knuckle guy you were talking about. Mm, yeah. Where you, you, they're they're in past Zelda games. You fought hands. But this one reminded me of um, the boss looked a lot like the hands you fight in Mario 64, which was, <laughs> just rem gave me, you know, it's like, oh, that's really cool. I'm going to kill you now. Um, <laughs> that was a lot of fun. And, and once you realize that, you, you know, it's a lot easier to get away by just merging to the wall yes. and going away. Like, I didn't realize that at first. I was trying to traverse the little me too. And, you know, eventually they go away. And <laughs> I thought that was uh, that was probably my favorite. But uh you know, the final boss is also really good, but I'm not going to spoil why because <laughs> uh, that would be mean. Um, but, yeah, I don't really have a least favorite. I mean, maybe maybe that little worm, that was pretty boring. Like, it was just a bigger worm, and you just had to, like, slice <laughs> at it until it died. That Which was one was that one? I think it was, like, early on, so I shouldn't really give it too much discredit. Mm. But I'm trying to remember. I don't remember a worm, but, again, I played through the first little bit of it uh, right before Christmas, and then I picked it up again probably a week and a half or two weeks ago so i had a bit of a gap there where i've kind of forgotten what i was doing because stupid pokemon <laughs> stole me away from zelda what about you john what's your uh favorite and least favorite of the bosses yeah. my favorite was definitely the boss at the end of the dark palace uh, mm. he just he's such a cool looking creature lights go out all you see is his glowing eyes mm, as creepy. he's chasing you around the room <laughs> And uh, and he's got some kind of a motion blur effect to him. So they, they just they really amped up the, uh, the 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 drama on that one. It was really fun. Um, my least favorite boss would probably be any boss that they pulled pretty much 
unchanged from Link to the Past. I uh, like mm -hmm. the hookshot boss where you're just pulling the eyeballs off. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. right. I mean, I got there, and it's like, it's still a fun battle. It was a good battle the first time, but mm -hmm. I know You knew exactly goes. what to do as soon yeah, as you see the boss. Yeah, Pull the hook, hook shot out, just, you know, pull him, drag him back to me, and, and, and you know, slash at him with my blade until yeah. they're dead. Uh, so, you know, that kind of stuff. It was like, it's okay. It didn't hurt the game for me, but... Mm -hmm. I, Definitely not my favorites. All right. So overall, for A Link Between Worlds, what would you guys say out of 10, how would you rank the game? <laughs> <laughs> yes, I'm putting you on the spot. Uh, uh. I like I like one to four. Okay. All right. All right. One to four then. One to four. <laughs> <laughs> uh, because with, with larger scales, it's too easy to pick a middle ground and not really say anything. Hmm. You know, like three out of five, what does that mean? <laughs> it means you don't have an opinion. <laughs> five out of ten, what is that? Uh, so what is out that? of four stars, I will give it four stars. Nice. It, it is Can I give half stars? <laughs> no, no, you can't. It's as good a Zelda game as you can play. Yep. What about I, you, I think, Ryan? How many stars? <laughs> I think John just invented the gamers in ranking scale. Yeah, absolutely. I like that, I, I like that idea of yeah. four stars, no halfsies, no take backsies. <laughs> um, you know, Ryan needs rules and the... structure. <laughs> I'm a programmer. I'm very, you know, logical. If, You're also then, very I'll... on the fence with like everything. You never want to say anything bad. Or... Why no. this is a great system? <laughs> you know? And I have to say, like, it was, it was, you know, one of my favorite Zeldas. Like, if I were to. If, if I were to sit back and play all of them, it's probably be my favorite. But uh, yeah, no, four stars is is a very valid ranking because I loved it. So yeah, you really couldn't give it any other ranking. Yeah, so. I think uh, that's definitely where it is for me too. And I, again, I haven't finished it, but what I have experienced keeps me coming back. I'm not bored. I'm challenged. The only thing that keeps me from playing it more often is that the only time I get to play it is on the bus. And depending on the bus driver, it's either super fine and I can play it for an hour or I feel nauseous after two minutes and I have to stop. So <laughs> it's or really you're stuck hit and in a miss. Snowstorm. Or yeah, I get stuck in a snowstorm. Um, but yeah, I think overall, I mean, it's, I love my 3DS. I don't regret my purchase at all. Um, so I would say if you don't have one, go get it to play this game. There are lots of great titles coming out or already out for the 3DS. And I really think that everyone should experience this game. And especially if you're a Zelda fan like this, you cannot miss this title. No, that's, that's very, that's very true. So I think, oh my God, we guys, we all agreed. And not only did we all agree, but we all liked it. <laughs> this has probably been the most positive Nintendo-themed episode we've ever had. We even had a conversation about the Wii U, and that went pretty well. We all agree that Nintendo's magic napkins need to come back because they are sorely needing them. Well, yeah, and, and in the case that I gave anybody the impression of my last uh, appearance as, as your guest <laughs> that I don't like games or that I'm a curmudgeon <laughs> about games. I do love some games very much. And, you just uh, have high is, standards. <laughs> I do. I have high, very high standards for games. That's good. Yeah, that is not a bad thing. So uh, just before we move on to where you can find us and where you can find John, I just wanted to remind everybody that you can go and grab a Gamers In shirt over at SlashLoot.com. So if you want to support the show, we get a part of the proceeds from each of the sales. You can find other shirts as well from the Frog Pants community, uh, from my other show, The Angry Chicken, from uh, Ryan's other show, Zombie D Zombies Ate My Podcast. I apologize for butchering that. <laughs> It's all good. The zombies will get you. Yeah, that's, that's probably true. <laughs> so, <laughs> get it too, don't worry. I'm awful with guns. <laughs> Not guns, dude. You don't need stuff with ammo. You need to get a good axe. Anyway. You get up in there, they're going to chew your arms off. Man. <laughs> you really just can't win. Uh, yeah. So again, that is SlashLoot.com for all your gamers in t-shirt needs. So John, why don't you tell everyone where they can find you? I am Icon Master Online. You do a search for that. You'll find me on Twitter, on app.net, uh, my website, uh, whatever you like. Are you are you still using that whole app.net thing? Uh, app.net is my favorite social network. Really? Man, I tried that for like two days. <laughs> <laughs> I just can't get away from Twitter. <laughs> <laughs> 
All right, so I think that pretty much does it for us this week on the Gamers In. You can visit us on the web at gamersinpodcast.com. You can find us on A Move TV along with other fabulous podcasts, including Starcast, Campaign Roundtable, Biggest Fan, A Move Radio, and The Angry Chicken. You can follow us on Twitter. You can find me, Jocelyn, at GIS Gamer. Ryan is at R Murphy. John is at Icon Master. And don't forget to follow the show at The Gamers In. The video versions of all our episodes can be found on our YouTube channel, which is youtube.com slash Jocelyn Moffat. You can also find us on Facebook and Google+. Sometimes. I make no promises. Also, you can email the show at info at gamersinpodcast.com. So before we go, I just want to give a quick shout out and thank you to Greg Moffat for creating our music. You can find him on Twitter at Sounds Influence. We would also like to thank Joel Duggan, who does all of our graphic work. You can find him and everything he does at joelduggan.com. So thanks for staying at the Gamers Inn, and remember, tune in next week. Good night, everybody. Goodbye.